And I remember collecting money for the black babies, collecting pennies for the black babies. And I had just come back, this was the phrase that was used. And I had just come back from Nigeria. My Nigerian grandparents are like extremely wealthy. And I was just like, I don't, I was nine or so. I was like, I I don't think like they need your pennies. Like my grandparents have like the chauffeur and like, and uh, I got like, I got pulled out of my classroom and just told to stop lying I needed to get over the chip on my shoulder. Wow. It was just it was very confusing. You know? <laughs> God, let's hope that I'll doesn't do, make I'll it do. into the jingle. <laughs> <laughs> You're burrowing into Byron, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you used to uh, clean and maintain fish to, tanks for, yeah, the, for the movie stars, for the rich and famous of Hollywood. For the hoi polloi of Hollywood. Polloi, sorry. Did you ever nick any of their oh, underwear? I, mean, I would never admit that on a podcast. It's too late now. A I private mean, this chat, was, maybe, this was but years, you know, years ago. This was years ago. Tom. Oh, hello. We were just talking about how Byron used to uh, steal from the underwear drawers in mansions in Malibu when he was maintaining their tropical fish tanks. <laughs> <laughs> Is this another one of Byron's uh, ventures? Oh, so yeah, you used to work for this great company in Studio City called Mark's Fish. And uh, Mark was... Mark's Fish. Mark's Fish. Mark's Fish. <laughs> Do you yes. think Mark could have come up with something slightly well, more well, original? Mark was than a that. bit of a rock and roll celeb it's himself. Cool man, so it's cooler that way. He was part of Strawberry Alarm Clock, so that was his claim to fame. That's so a, he was what, quite cool. What, what was that originally, Strawberry Alarm Clock? Uh, Incense and Peppermints. I think they were one of those sort of one hit wonders, 70s bands. 70s, oh, 60s yeah. Bands. Because there's an yeah. Irish radio show that's quite consistent. I think it's a morning show called The Strawberry Alarm Clock, which I assume must be. Must be a mm. must be an homage or a mm. ripoff mm. or something. So, uh, limo driver who dressed in a pink cocktail dress. Yeah, that's um, one of my favourites. <laughs> 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 Tropical fish masseur. <laughs> hey, your pins a little tight there. Hold on. We're just yeah, God, we're you've been, yeah, you've been you've Can't been really a tropical fish chiropractor. <laughs> Also known as a sushi chef. You can't, be a, a fish yeah. you can't be a chiropractor to an invertebrate. <laughs> Ooh, oh, I just a little too far there. Sorry, lobster. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. So, so what else so, did you, did so, you ever sing a relaxing tune to a crustacean? Well, gosh, of course everyone does. That's, that's <laughs> common knowledge. Well, that's a good act. It's a big difference. Uh, hey, so... On this lovely episode of The Earth Locker, we are speaking to Miss Emma DeBerry. Who, explain why she used to work for you she for is, a period? She's OG, original bartender of my lovely little cocktail bar. Mm, um, off Broadway. Off Broadway and when- East London. East London. Sexy little yep. spot. An amazing person. And she's just an ap- academic and mm. quite outspoken and quite well-educated. Serious, clever clubs. Cool as sin. And writes for The Guardian. So I think we're going to have Times, some really good crack. For, and she's been- yeah. uh, been a presenter on television right now and online and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. working she's, on a doctorate and mm. she's written a book called uh, don't touch my don't hair touch which is my been hair published in america mm. with a new title which she'll tell us about and, and she's uh, irish and she's irish and nigerian. she's irish mom and nigerian father i believe yep. uh, i heard her on blind boys podcast one of his live podcasts i heard her uh, as the guest and it was interesting Hello. And then Byron goes, oh, we can have Emma Tiberia. She used to work for me. I was like, oh, what? Yeah, she, she should remember you, I think. She was serving bar when you were there. Oh, yeah. When you were hanging out. Because she, her and Jeff Ain- Lada and all those guys. Mm, ancient were all history. The who was that lovely Canadian lady who, was, uh, who worked with us on the pond in Dalston, uh, who was the Al- co- mixologist? Yeah, Alex. Alex. Alex yeah. She was lovely. She was so lovely. Now that's an interesting thing, a mixologist, because there's a difference between a sort like a bartender and then yeah. a flaring cocktail maker and then a mixologist. Oh. So a mixologist is actually specifically someone who works on the taste of the cocktail, right? Mm, I right? don't think there's a difference. I think it's a bunch of ponts. Either. I think a bartender is more than brilliant. I think a mixologist is just like say, I'm not an actor, I'm a thespian. <laughs> oh, okay. I just like, like, like the same damn word. What are you talking? About? I don't well, I remember I, this. The truth. Because <laughs> I, I remember when I was working with this. I, very early on in my twenties, I did work to, before acting took off. I worked uh, when you were on the skittles. Basically, when I was on the skittles and couldn't get work because I was a little bit chubs around the edges. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, I worked for this hospitality company where they teach you how to be waiters, basically. Right. And then they send you off on jobs, right? right. And there was just this South African guy who was like, uh, right, I'm going to teach you how to make a cocktail. And this, this gives them something very clear. I'm not a bartender. I'm a mixologist. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was like, let's get him on the podcast. The I was a mixologist. Literally, I was like, you sound like a scientist or something. In the back a scientist of the head. Drinks. Get over yourself, you muppet. <laughs> Because he uses well, I love the out glasses. Of yeah, he uses test tubes and dry ice so that it gets that lovely, you get that lovely smoke coming off of it. Uh, That's yeah. a mixologist. You want the smoke? I think a mixologist maybe what he means they have no people skills. That's why you call yourself <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a bartender. Is on, is on the level with a priest. Yeah, you know. Oh, you go see the priest Sunday morning, the bartender Saturday night. I mean, we both take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. And also, you'd get more honesty out of someone after a few, <laughs> a few whiskey. What, what are them? What are the jacks? What are them lovely ones you do? Picklebacks. Oh, picklebacks. Yeah. What's a pickleback for the world, Byron? Pickleback is a shot of whiskey followed by some pickle brine juice. And in America, it's a big thing. We try to make it a big thing here with Jameson's. And oh, yeah. I've heard uh, of them. It is lovely. It's, it's quite good. It's an acquired taste. It's not quite acidic. It's, yeah, it's salty. It's sour. It's, and if you make the pickle brown, pickles by scratch like I did, so it's a natural fermentation. So it was actually full of lots of probiotics because it was natural, natural vinegar. The fermentation, he, I, yeah, yeah. He can brew beer and all. He can... Um, and then I make pickles. Yeah, pickle juice. he can make um, uh, It's really hard. Uh, you fingers on the teeth and those little cucumbers. It's hard. This little pickle juice that comes out. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good one. It's a good one to know about that. I'm Pickle Byron. He's Pickle Byron. <laughs> pickle Byron. Does that mean that we can... No. We can try and juice we you. We can ferment Byron. <laughs> we can search your nook and crannies for niplets. <laughs> niplets! Oh, I can hope not. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear anyway <laughs> so far so, um, so good yeah picklebacks how did we get onto all that oh yeah bartending oh yeah that was the thing i was going to say to you so my friends have a very cool and trendy gallery in east london called basement space and their previous space is right around the corner from off broadway and now it's a harry potter cocktail bar Right. Oh, I know about that place. Yeah. And you go in, they can give you, they give you a wand, right? And you go up to a, a sort of a, mach a machine that does automatic cocktail, and you tap, you tap the magic thing, and then, and then you confess to your terrible sins. No, you don't. You just, and then you, uh, you can sort of custom serve yourself cocktail with a Harry Potter wand, and yeah. it's all been done very sort of Hogwarts. Wow. It's actually really cool. That but is cool. It's reminding me because the guy in there is definitely on the mixologist a, end of the spectrum. I'm a mixologist and a Harry Potter nerd. He was very serious. He was a very serious I'm a Harry chap. Potter. I would never call myself a mixologist. No, you call yourself yeah. a wizard. <laughs> you're not an alcoholic. You're a wizard, <laughs> Harry. I call myself the wheezy wizard. <laughs> would you like a drink? <laughs> Yeah, let me just cast a spell on you. <laughs> cast a spell on you. I've got some fermented pickle juice <laughs> I here. I make you forget everything. Five shots, oblivioso. <laughs> you don't yeah. remember anything, do you? <laughs> oblivioso. <laughs> Byron's bar off Broadway has a cat living in it that looks a bit like Hitler. It's I'll a, be honest. It's like a chairman meow. Really? Was well, it got a little tash? Yeah, oh, he's got a little beauty mark. He's but he's definitely got an evil despot sort of disposition. Yeah, he's, he does. He he's looks a horrible little the world kind of vibe. Like. He does have feeling. a fascist vibe going on, yeah. Like brain from Pinky and the Brain. A little bit. He yeah, looks like cat. he looks like Hitler after a three day house party. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I can also tell you that, that his mustache has gone slightly askew. That, that cat has now broken my computer. Last week he was sleeping on my keyboard, knocked off three keys, and then all my drives don't read anymore. And then day before yesterday he jumped over my computer. <laughs> I'm doing some work on the bar. Smacked into the screen, and now my black has lines in it, and the screen just looks when like When will this cat's reign of terror end? Honestly. Oh. He's costing the podcast money. He's costing yeah. the podcast money. <laughs> Absolutely we, have to, we have to sign a treaty with this cat before it goes any further. <laughs> we'll Chairman Meow, you'll rue the day. Oh, you're the second person I know who's named their cat Chairman Meow. The first person I met was David Badil. The, no the way. Ever comedian. The comedian. 
who actually years ago, it's long enough ago now to probably talk about it. I was supposed to do this film that David Baddiel had written, was going to direct, called Romeo and Gertrude, which was... Oh, is that the story of what would have happened if Gertrude and Romeo would have carried on, if he'd never met Juliet? Well, no, it's Gertrude who was Hamlet's mum. Right? Oh, right. Like most sort of said to be the most disliked female Shakespearean character, right? And it was like a, a sort of a modern rom-com, Romeo and Juliet, where we then kind of transported back to Verona, Shakespeare times, right? So it's like, it becomes kind of real Romeo and Juliet. But instead of the guy in the modern musical play who's playing Romeo, instead of him being Romeo in the, in the past times, it's like the nerdy guy in the back who sweeps up and he does a bit of the lighting and stuff. And her, she's the Juliet and her sort of dream world, she casts this other guy as her Romeo, who was me. And then, uh, and then the, there, was sort of a, there was this American collaboration thing. And then it became Romeo and Britney. The title changed to Romeo and Britney. And then it just sort of fell apart. It never, never actually happened. Never came like, to many, like many movies in the... Uh... The graveyard of it nearly happened. Was it actually a book before? No, nah, it, it was just the thing he'd, he'd written. Yeah, it was a whole play on on Romeo and Juliet, very kind of tongue in cheek Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. And then, but so I never got to meet his chairman Meow. Damn it. I bet yours is more fascistic than yeah, definitely than his. Yeah, mine's not, mine's not literary at all. <laughs> 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 but really mean looking. There's that great picture. Check it out if um, anyone's interested in the in the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who's a very interesting philosopher, went to Oxford from Austria. But there's a picture of him when he's like seven or eight years old in a cl- in his classroom photo, and he sit down the front, and he's kind of looking to the side. He looks quite pensive, like that, like a little boy. And three rows back, who stood there, arms folded, looking all mean and bullyish? Hitler. No <laughs> way. <laughs> they was in the same class. Yeah. Wow, that's something you're going to downplay at the class reunions, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Remember that time, Adolf? Oh, let's not talk about that, please. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Ludwig, you're doing well. <laughs> Adolf, what have you been up to? Uh, <laughs> This is none of your business. Yeah. You stay out of them beer halls, Adolf. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, are we seeing to- and Tom? We're doing some uh, filmic trickery. So we're seeing you on our monitor there. To burn. Oh. Right. Is that right? Yeah. So you're on there. Hey, would so I... I should really be doing <laughs> this. Yeah, oh, come on. Be you. more professional, Tom. <laughs> I like, right, or are you yeah. going to mirror it? So I need no, to do yeah. this. I think we're just. Oh God, I have no idea. I think you both just mess with storms. That's too right. late. That's it, on my screen, it's coming up as I need to do this. So I go, hey, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. How you doing? Exactly. Uh, yeah, Rob, yeah. what, what do yeah. you, uh, what do you think of? Uh, Your hair's growing. Byron, you know? <laughs> you what? Your yeah, hair's growing. Yeah. Come back. Tom, what do, you, flip-flops, Rob. what do you think of Byron's bo? Crikey, Whew. right there Ooh. in the. Always oh. a bit. <laughs> That's that pickle juice. It's that. That's where it comes from. <laughs> Timurik in that. In that Chinese secret. It's a circular economy. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> oh dear. So when our guest Emma Debiri comes on, will she also be on the monitor? Uh, uh, yes, Byron's she will be. She will be yes. That's good. So there'll be a nice fifty-fifty split. Oh, very nice. Yeah. That'd we'll just be, really be like mini versions of you. Although you guys are about the same. Your torsos are about filling the the screen. Oh, mighty torsos! We should just put little screens on you so we're all, we're all, we all match. <laughs> yeah, Make you look like you're all in a monitor. <laughs> yeah. I'll get some cardboard boxes behind St. Fairs. Yeah, day. just put yourself in a cardboard box. Or get one of those cupboards behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Which does look like the set of Anchorman. Yeah, it's very, <sighs> it's very kind of um, 60s, isn't it? Yeah. You know? I have a friend from the Lake District, Michael. We were just talking about him. And uh, he has a little side business where he goes up to the north of England and gets lots of furniture in this style because it was really, really, really popular in the 60s and 70s up north. And then he drives it down to London, sells it for a fortune. Does he really? Because it's back in style. It's back in style. That's it. Called mid-century something or another. It's called 
like that Harry Enfield sketch. It's called I Saw You Coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. But he make, he's kicking some ass at that. He's yeah, that. I was trying to find um, one of those cool, like, wingback chairs that, like, are on a little... Oh, they, like... they twizzle. Yeah. I'll hook you up. I, oh, I'll please, yeah. I've been trying to find one for a long time. Hmm. But they're all extortionately expensive now. So I'm, I'm trying to find a second-hand one that people, you hmm. know, someone just doesn't want anymore. What do you, say, what do you mean? Like an old, like a, a, an old office one? Um, more than that. They're like, it's like a 60s lounging chair. I forgot what they're called. They're almost like a cross between like a bucket chair and then they, they twizzle all the way around. Oh. So you can spin all the way around them, but they, they're like a wingback yeah. chair. Wing oh, am I doing this right? You know, like this. Yeah, right here. Quite, quite sort of 60s vibe. Yeah, oh like, yeah, very. But I, I kind of want to get a leather one. It's, it's, uh, they look great. Yeah, 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 yeah. D- like, um, excuse me, like a Dr. Evil chair. Exactly. Yeah. And I'll, <laughs> I'll borrow Byron's cat. Yeah. The cat, yeah, I mean, that cat would, that cat would be great in, in, a, in movies, like in a super villain's hands. It would. It might overshadow. Maybe you should put him on uh, on a spotlight and get him some auditions. Yeah. Spotlight, the, yeah. Uh, spotlight for those who don't know is a British casting <laughs> website. For cats specifically. For cats specifically. <laughs> but, um, I was going to say all your cat acting needs. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, they're making your film and you're flipping through five hundred cat resumes. <laughs> This one, she did two Felix the Cat cat food commercials. But they're, they're known to be temperamental, but they're perfect for the role. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay. Do you know, um, <laughs> Dr. Evil, Mike Myers based, that character Dr. Evil he does is completely based on Lorne Michaels. No way. Did, uh, Saturday Night Live. Right. <laughs> that's like, <laughs> that's this guy Lorne Michaels. Yeah, so if, well, I think uh, Emma curious. might be with us ever so shortly. <gasps> she might be in the virtual. She's in room. the ethereal world. Ah! She's in the real world. There's proof. Hello, Emma. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, well, we'll get you. We get we'll get you unmuted, and then we we'll have be good to roll. we have Emma visually, but not audioly. Emma, don't worry. This is typical of every single episode of the Earth Locker. It starts off with technical difficulties. <laughs> If it didn't, people would think something's wrong. Well, I think we're paying too much money for the production, right? <laughs> yeah. People would think really? there are other people in the room. I know. <laughs> you know, just I'm a here. old fud daddy couple here. All right, we're going to start that again. The top. Are you both wearing dungaree? Oh, no, you don't have a dungarees on. You've got a, a low cut vest, a scoop neck vest. Glorified pajamas, Emma. Nice. They're quite rough cotton to be glorified pajamas, though, aren't they? Yeah, they're a bit, they're a bit, <laughs> a bit exfoliating they're a bit as lin- you sleep. A bit linen-y. You wouldn't go to sleep in them. Nice no. color palette, though, with the, the vest and the trouser together. So. Oh, yeah. Hey, guys, welcome. Thanks, Emma, Emma DeBerry. Emma. Emma. Hey, Emma. Dabbery. 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 Yeah. You have lovely lush plants behind you. You look like you're sat in S- Sri Lanka, not in Dublin. <laughs> yeah, where <laughs> I'm are you, Emma? I'm in, I'm in lo- London. Oh, you're in London, are you? I'm in London, oh, yeah. Some fantastic plants and greenery around you in London. It's great. Yeah, because my my place has a lot of light, and the plants respond extremely well to it. Can I no, come around and try and clone them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my herbs key. I got I got some a whole load of new herbs. Right, maybe you can help me, Emma. My basil keeps dying. <laughs> you know okay. what? It's my basil. You have to sing yeah. to it, Mum. You have to sing to it. You, you know what? I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. So I'm rubbing cream into my hands, not like nervously grasping them. Um, I what was I going to say? Yeah, basil. We could hear the cream. We could hear. Yeah, it's the basil that keeps dying. Hear the lusciousness of it. Until I lived in this place with the amazing light, my basil too always died. Oh, I feel so seen. <laughs> oh. Um, my basil always died as well, but it's thriving here. Um, Wait, nothing so different is like, happening to it. It's just the light. Situation. Plenty of sun, plenty of warmth, Thomas. Interesting, because it gets the sun quite a lot, the basil, because it's the first, it's the one on the end. So the sun moves around like this. It's growing inside your house, not outside, is that right? No, it's outside. The problem is, though, that it, they haven't had direct sun in Leicestershire since 1973. That's the it is a problem. Yeah. But they did win the premiership a few years ago, so that's some consolation. 2016. 
That really helps Basil, I think. Never forget. <laughs> I was in Cape Town at the time. Basil, Basil was the thing. <laughs> Missed the whole thing in Cape Town. I was watching the street party that was happening in Leicester City Centre. I thought, that's never going to happen again. Never. And it hasn't. There's time. Well, it nearly did. Uh, t- tell us about dis- disobedient bodies. I'm very interested in disobedient bodies. Oh, yeah. So disobedient bodies was, um, or is, a platform that I started in this lockdown situation. Um, I posted something about, um, like, Naomi, Naomi Wolf talking about... Um, it was a quote that I'd actually used in my book, Don't Touch My Hair, but it was a quote from Naomi Wolf where she talks about um, women, like basically cultures that really centralize dieting and women's thinness and how it's really not about, it's not really about beauty, but it's actually about, um, it's about obedience and kind of keeping women like distracted by thinking about something that is essentially not really (laughs) not that important but if we're focused on that we're not going to be kind of focused on other stuff and she rings so true doesn't it It rings very very true with the kind of western paradigm of female beauty in the mainstream you know it feels like it's about being ferociously wound tight stick thin you know and you ask i guarantee you the majority of men they tell you that that's it's not what floats their boat you know what i mean you like yeah you know i don't even i don't even know as well it's definitely to do with desirability and men but it's, it's also to do with like women's perceptions like of themselves and 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 each other and i think like a lot of that um a lot of a lot of it, like a lot, w- women have also internalized these same kind of patriarchal norms. So mm. it's not kind of just as simple as thinking, oh, it's about desirability and men. I think there's a lot of other stuff going on there as well. And certainly it's like a, like a, it's very much, um, can you hear the baby kind of screaming in the background? I, Emma, it's 100%, lovely, yeah. it's, it's lovely. lovely. Yeah, <laughs> this is the real world and people have kids. We, we have kids, Tom has kids, I got kids. We had a guest he previously a kid. whose dog was going mad. We it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but your, your kids aren't, aren't there, are they? Well, yeah. yeah. Mine are, mine are just around there. Not yeah, the but they're, they're being occupied. They're not being left to... Well, left to, to a degree. Degree. And I yeah. think yeah. that maybe is the, the difference in gender gender dynamics you know you're i i don't know if your partners are women but i'm assuming they are but they're somewhere keeping the kids quiet no the toms are chained up around the corner i mean I know, yeah, we I know them up. bobby bobby maximus we had him on a show and we chit chat with him and his kid was on the show and he said 100 percent that is his hard fast rule if his kid you don't like seeing his kid on his podcast don't watch his podcast yeah yeah like he doesn't care about polish or this is his life and this or, is him and I really yeah. respected that opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really changed my thing. Like, we don't need to have this cookie cutter sterilized presentation. So mm. for me, it's not about <laughs> cookie cutter. Or just it bugs the crap out of you. Just like, Shut up. <laughs> I just don't. I just don't want them on. I just. I. I just don't want them on the on the podcast. You yeah. know? Well, they're on it now, Emma. <laughs> well, <laughs> as long as you too late, Emma. <laughs> on it. Don't tie them up like mine. It's it's much easier. <laughs> just put a gag. Yeah. You get a, a good gag. It should quieten them right down. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll bear that in mind for, for the next time. Um, I don't have a gag to hand, sadly. Yeah, so beauty, beauty standards. Um, yeah, something I go into in Don't Touch My Hair, which is the book that I um, published last year, but is just about to be published in the States in a couple Woo-hoo! of weeks. What's the title for it in the States? Twisted, The Tangled Twisted. History of Black Hair. That's pretty good. Thanks. Yeah, which is a better title. It's the same book, right? You think it's a better, yes, the same book. It's the same book. We couldn't use that. Which is the better title? Which is the better title? You tell me. I suppose it depends. I mean, don't, I suppose, don't touch my hair is more like on the shelf. It's more eye catching. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I would be like, ooh. Mm -hmm. What's the double meaning there? And really, I think, you know, because I'm doing, a, I'm doing a book myself at the moment. You know? And the, the, the title is a law about that. I mean, there's been conversations around it being very much about being eye-catching and, and, and for people who might know you or might not know you. Yeah, yeah. And be like, ooh, and, and be of a, a draw for everybody. So I'm going to go with the first. yeah. I hear that. I guess the the reason, the rationale behind it was was the title that we used here was too similar to the title of another book in the states, uh, so, which is uh, which is. Touch my um, hair. 
<laughs> you still you still can't touch my hair right and other things right. i mean there's a an, that's another, but it's very, it's very similar is yeah. it a similar subject matter um it's uh it's mm, it it touch I, it touches it touches on hair but it's about the other book is about a lot more but i think it's right. more just about um things that um white people do to black people that <laughs> they shouldn't do but not right. just focused on hair and it's, so, it's, it's written by a comedian so it's a lot funnier than my book <laughs> <laughs> well fair play at least you're oh on. no yeah like <laughs> Um, I, which could be kind of called microaggressions. I heard yourself and Blind Boy speaking on your podcast, and that oh, was all right. Yeah, about that was a lovely chat. It was really nice. Where did you do that? Was that in Vicker Street? It was in Vicker Street. Yeah, I love Vicker Street. Vicker Street. Vicker Street is a um, predominantly music venue in in central Dublin, which is run by a lovely human called Bren Berry, or at least he curates a lot of the music. And I love mm. Bren dearly dearly with a passion and vicar street it's a great yeah, spot it's a great venue and i've seen so many gigs there um of really like I- iconic acts over the years so it was kind of mad to like to be on the stage yeah um everyone plays there talking about afrofuturism and whatnot but uh, yeah it was it was i really enjoyed it um yeah you know what i'm actually like deeply dehydrated so i'm going to walk away for a moment <laughs> and get some water you use exactly. the plants. Get the, <laughs> now the, the moisture from the nearest thing. No, we'll, we'll go for it, Emma. Go for it. We'll okay, I'll be back in a second. All right, okay. yeah, no problem. <laughs> and we wait. Da, 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 da. Hey, Tom. How are Thomas, you? Thomas, let's, let's yeah, interview the Let's interview uh, light, the light's looking a lot better on you, I must say. You, I don't know where you were sitting before, but you were definitely... Yeah, I know. That's why I moved, because it was aggressive. <laughs> the light's gone. Uh, <laughs> you were gone. You were gone more golem than ever, Thomas. You, you, <laughs> I know. You've gone into back in the shadows. Returned. Aha! You look ah. glowing with hydration now. Yeah, good. Yeah. Hey, you, uh, uh, look on your little uh, <laughs> phone. I just sent you a message of a photo because I was cleaning up the bar and remodeling and cleaning things up, and see if uh, you recommend the recognize a photo I just sent you. And. Uh, yeah. We'll need to describe this. Oh my God. <laughs> Give us a look on the Zoom. Give us a look on the Zoom. You know, I actually thought I was kind of fat then. That's so wild. <laughs> let's have a look for, for, for all the... It's, yeah, let's show the world. The listeners, there's a, there's a, a delightful photo of Emma looking oh, like... Emma. You'll be able to see. From back in the day. Yeah, close, yeah, yeah, close, closer. No, yeah, yeah, there we yeah, go. It, Oh, beautiful! A photo st- session done by the wonderful Gabby Matola, Gabriella Matola, and she did uh, portraits of all the bartenders of Off Broadway and the staff, and it was quite amazing. Wow! And, I, mean, I mean, this is what's oh. interesting. Back in those days, you came to me, and you were like this uber human. You were a model. <laughs> you were a nightclub promoter. You were an academic. You were completely politically aware and vocal and you know don't freaking look at me the wrong way and heaven forbid when you get drunk man you were violent <laughs> <laughs> violent <laughs> violent <laughs> emma did you ever bottle byron <laughs> ah, close to close to but sorry we all have we all have just, just tim <laughs> oh, just good old tim. do you remember did you meet him I don't know. No. Okay. I just, I can't remember. It's a I, long time ago. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I, do, I do think though that Byron, I think you might be fantasizing about the, our crossover time because I don't, I don't remember fully coming in until more like 23, 24, which mm. was more like eight years ago. Yeah. And I had, I had, I had like had my first son by then. So I wasn't like, I wasn't in, I wasn't in the bar. I always get confused. I just assume you and Jess Lotto were there the entire time. It just definitely stayed on longer. It's just yeah. a haze of but, liquor. But it is fascinating so, because you were stunning, thank you, you know, <laughs> and made your money as off your looks. I mean, you like this billboard where you're the face of Bailey's, the lips of Bailey's. I remember that one Christmas. It was hilarious. Like, oh, God, yeah. Emma's yeah. lips. <laughs> I remember that picture. So Taking what brought back. you down from there where you making your money off how you look to disobedient bodies and being an advocate. And I mean, the don't touch my hair is definitely a thing about that as well. Like look, love me for who I am. Don't mess with it. Right. Is it, I mean, how, how do you think that progression went? Yeah. So I was never like, even when I was doing commercial modeling, I wasn't 
really like this is my life's work and this is like really like what I feel is like particularly important to me but if I had the opportunity to do it and to make money then I was like I was more than happy to but I will say that even like by the time I don't know it's weird like actually if I look at like the that photograph of myself I'm like I thought I was pretty like secure in my appearance by that stage in my life but I'm looking at myself and I was like actually I would say bordering on like quite painfully thin um but at the time I actually was quite concerned about my weight that seems well, kind of eating disordery. <laughs> well, is it is it is it an eating disorder? So you it was an eating disorder because you were overly concerned about your food, or because just purely because of your weight that um, you thought you were too heavy. Like, well, I'm just curious why you think it's an eating disorder. I said eating disordery. So eating kind disordery. Of like, oh, okay. Kind of like not. I'm not going. I'm not going to name yeah, yeah, yeah. As an eating disorder per se. Picture. I see like a very thin person. Yeah, yeah. Who, we're very slender. Yeah, who yeah. was, which is fine. But I remember at that time not thinking that actually yeah. being like, oh, I have to be very careful um, because I'm kind of like a little bit like. You thought you were unhealthy, or I thought I probably. Did, I didn't realize I was thin. I thought I was probably like maybe too big. Yeah. You know? yeah. A little, <laughs> a little <laughs> morphia going on there. Probably just morphia. Um, That's, um, it. That's it, yeah. So, but that, that aside, I am, um, because I think when I was younger than that, like when I was um, kind of in my early 20s, I lost not a lot of weight, but I went from being kind of like maybe just kind of normal to being like super skinny mm. and the change that that brought about my life was really really very immediately noticeable right what do you mean you started I, the benefits from getting skinny from i was getting, like yeah. yeah i was definitely like kind of rewarded um in terms of well i mean what do you consider well i guess being able to do yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that. And, what, and in terms of like the attention that I got from people, and I, I feel like the the value which with which I was, um, a, 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 which was afforded towards me, people's reactions, yeah, were were were, were different. And so can it gives I ask? Like a really, it gives a really like dreadful message, and I think it's like all the stuff that's been happening here you know, with Adele recently, um, who's been being really praised for having lost all this weight it just kind of reaffirms the idea that if you lose weight, then you are actually, you've done a good thing. You've done something. You're, you're you're this is where there's a blurred line here because there is a, there's a key factor here, obviously about the aesthetic and then there's the, the inner health factor, right? So mm -hmm. that we, we all know that being overweight is a contributor to many problems with our health. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to losing weight, I found the whole thing with Adele actually, um, because we don't know her reasons for doing it. I yeah. certainly don't believe that it's purely to do with her, her desire for an aesthetic. It maybe is partly that. But mm -hmm. if someone's doing it because they want to benefit their own health and feel better, yeah. losing weight is a very positive thing, not a, not a negative. Yeah, right? 100%. But I didn't do it like through like exercising or anything that would be deemed like right. healthy. I just didn't, I, I just very obsessively policed the amount yeah. of calories. I what did you, what did you go, what did you, what was your diet typically when you were in your weight losing phase, Emma? <laughs> so yeah. I was actually, I, I was quite like generous with myself in terms of like, there wasn't anything that I just 100% wouldn't eat apart from maybe like mayonnaise or something. Oh my God, actually, I remember I ate like, I remember I ate a California. Why? Because it seems like it's from outer space. No, because I was just like, oh, that's just like, that's just like a, ca that's just calories. That's just pure mm. unbridled calories. I remember eating like a California, like sushi roll um, after years of not eating mayonnaise. And I was just like, <gasps> I was like, what's the white stuff in this? <laughs> Amazing. Like, what? I was like, I like it's mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I would just, I would kind of eat whatever I wanted, but minuscule portions. So I'd have like a taste of something and I would just have a certain calorie um, amount that I couldn't, I couldn't cross. I couldn't eat out or anything. And I had to measure everything I ate and it was just kind of boring and dull, but it kept me skinny. I but didn't. By the, by the time so I met you, I wasn't of... doing that. I wasn't when doing is that. It, I was just um, 
So when did it cross over from being, did you think there was a part of your mental state that went from either feeling like, because obviously there's an, an, a level of self-control, right? To stop you getting to a point where it, it does become like excessive and out of control and unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So you having trying those bits and bobs, did you feel that it had become some, what, as you say, like eater disordery, you know, did you feel like you were overly conscious of, not eating the right foods or eating too much of the wrong foods so we say yeah so like i wasn't able to eat out or like eat at a friend's house or anything because i wouldn't know how many calories were in what i was eating so i could only eat um i could only eat food i had prepared myself um and like weighed out and like very like been very obsessed oh, so you were doing like a zone diet thing where you weigh out all your food and you weigh out what how many calories are going to be consumed i don't i didn't have that name th then no that's just what it's that's just the, oh. the name of yeah like that style of dieting yeah, yeah so it was just it was just calorie counting um but after like years three four maybe five years of doing that. It was just really exhausting. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I yeah, stopped. Yeah, it's hard to maintain that. Yeah, but by this stage I was very thin. <laughs> so it was, it was okay, job done. Right. And, um, and, I was, and I actually was able to maintain that um, until, well, until I had, no, even after I had my first son, I was like super skinny again pretty, pretty quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess like now I had a baby like seven months ago. Um, and I guess congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, disobedient bodies was me just partially. Um, it's not just about bodies. It's also about like kind of the ideas that animate different forms of disobedience right. and, and um, looking at different like kind of means of like pr protest and, and dissident ideas. But in terms of um, the body and bodies and women's bodies, it was me just kind of like engaging with what my body looks like now after having had a baby seven months ago and like not, not actually hating it in the way that I would have if I was that yeah. version of myself that I was just describing. Yeah. What mm. other ideas uh, do you guys look at in terms of disobedience that aren't the body, Emma? It yeah. Um, so there, there, there was a massive, um, there was a, there was a really great response to the stuff about the body. And I can see that there's a real kind of thirst for that and for different types of um, kind of female um, beauty and representation. So I really could have just stuck to that, but um, my interests, um, yeah, go, go um, in addition to that, like go quite far beyond, beyond that. Um, so some of the stuff that we, so the next book that we're looking at, um, cause it's a book club as well, is called um, Trick Mirror. And um, it's an incredible book where the author Gia, oh gosh, what's her surname has just eluded me, but she looks at um, kind of social media and our use of, she just looks at this contemporary moment, but is very like critical of, or really like trains a critical lens on issues like um like kind of empowerment feminism and kind of girl boss feminism and all of these a lot of these ideas that online are currently being like sold to us as liberatory and empowering mm -hmm. but are actually in many ways just kind of deep more deeply entrenching like neoliberalism and yeah. are, are actually commodifying um commodifying yeah. forms of protest it's almost that yeah. thing mtv take you know they say that they corporatized uh stuff that makes fun of mtv or sort of you know is dissenting about mainstream corporate music they're like great we can corporatize that you know that nirvana was an example of that Exactly, exactly. So there's so much of the of the contemporary, what is sold as like, and it's sold to us as, um, well, contemporary feminism, which is, is really just kind of about strengthening the status quo. Like a lot of it has been untethered from a lot of the feminism of the feminism of the moment has been like untethered from its radical origins. Yeah, and also has everything to do with consumerism, I think. It's all days. about consumerism. So very, very strategically diverse mm. billboards and stuff. A lot of the imagery, at least, that I'm exposed to that 
has feministic overtones, you know, a lot of... Uh, feministic. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't we inventing words at the start of this podcast? That's part Absolutely. of this podcast. We invent a word at least one a podcast. Yeah. I love it. At, on, the old, it. on the old earth locker boobadoo. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, a lot of that sort of consumer, you know, consumerism, it feels like it's, has sort of clamped its clammy fist on these trends of, of feminism and stuff. Yeah, I mean, what do you, what, how do you think this neo-feminist hijacking of feminism as a political movement, um, and particularly how does it relate to women of color as well? Because it really, there is a divide there, I think, without question. You know, liberalism and then liberalism as is explained, being a, of a lower socioeconomic class or being of color is very different expressions of what you're fighting against, you know? Um, e- yeah, and I guess um, the, the the difference there, I guess, would be, I guess, feminism is in many ways, or has has been in many ways, uh, actually kind of identified as white feminism, um, but and and and, men, and and maybe like a lot of its concerns, which allege to be the concerns of all women. I heard a shriek. I heard a child's shriek. Yeah, that's my, one of my child. Hang on. Go you flinched, Emma. You flinched <laughs> like yours. it was your words. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. So I guess, I guess like a lot of feminism, um, yeah, was kind of named as, an, it, it's not kind of universal in the way it pur- purported to, but was actually more reflecting the concerns and realities of white, middle-class white women. And then you have, black feminism and womanism as a response to as a response to that but even within that division you definitely have um there are definitely there seems to kind of be this idea sometimes that if somebody is a woman um whatever she's doing by virtue of being a woman is a feminist action or if somebody is a black woman whatever she's doing by virtue of that is a black feminist action and i'm like that, that that's that that's not how it works like feminism is about um you know challenging patriarchal systems you can be a woman who is actually supporting and reinforcing patriarchal systems and just because you're a woman just because you're a woman and you're doing something, it does not make that feminist, you know? And I think that's what's a bit- I mean, um, the classic example would be like women in the boardroom, right? She's a woman, a woman in the boardroom. She's a woman, she's a CEO. She works 80 hours a week. She has no life balance. Well, she's a good feminist because she's a woman. Exactly. And there's- there's Doing everything backwards. There's that that, that meme (laughs) going around. Uh, Well, I think I first thought about a year ago, but it was just saying kind of liberals, um, I don't know if I can remember it fully off the top of my head, but it, it takes the kind of example of the prison guards, of, of a prison guard. And it says, it's like, we need more female prison guards rather than being like, no, there needs to be abolition of that system. You mm-hmm. know, so it's just about kind of like making the current deeply oppressive and unequal system more having better representation within this system rather than understanding that this system is rotten and yeah. needs to be destroyed. And Jet, like we do here on the on the Earth Locker. We, we, yeah. we destroy we, the uh, We're always attacking <laughs> the patriarchal, you know, like uh, the medical system, healthcare systems, because we get people on to point out where the rot is. And mm-hmm. going, like, yeah. there's way better versions of this based on up to date evidences and sciences. And I think, you know, uh, in that way, feminism is. Uh, the way you're put, putting it across is sort of, I think, genderless, you know, uh, it, 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 has, it isn't to do with the biology of the, mess, the messenger. Yeah. So I think yes. Is- and, 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 and feminism is, well, I, I guess like feminism is necessary because like one of the reasons that feminism is necessary is because it like addresses the um, unequal position of women in society and that needs to be that needs to be noted but ultimately feminine a, a feminist um expression of or organization of the world would make society better for for everybody and anybody can be a feminist like kind of yeah irrespective of gender yeah 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 oh so emma what the heck is the one thing that really pisses you off personally on this subject <laughs> um i'm sorry god so many things piss me off <laughs> <laughs> 
Come on, give me, give me, give me with some pet peeves. <laughs> Academically me, speaking or personally, whatever. <laughs> what pisses me off? Oh my God. Like, so there's, there's so much to choose from just generally or like about feminism or like. Yeah, something that you, th- you really get your goat. Like, oh, when I hear this, it makes my skin crawl. Yeah, that was the last thing you were book. like, oh my God, about feminism. Yeah, whatever you're doing right now, the thing that you're well, working on. I mean, there's, on. there's definitely things right now that are pissing me off a great deal more than kind of like divisions within feminism. That would be the absolute like shit show that that England is at the moment like it's just I don't know that I have the words to articulate how I express about what is happening in this country um at this moment in time and the mismanagement intentional or otherwise of this moment of crisis Mm. Um, so that would kind of be uh, uh, mis- a burning concern at the moment. Mis- mismanagement in terms of the lockdown? In terms of the lockdown, in terms of how everything is being handled, about um, the garbled instructions about how the lockdown is supposed to be ending, yeah. about the fact that they're not on top of, get, of, of, of bringing the cases down to the level that they should be before the lockdown ends. It, it, it's just... Like, it's funny. Yeah, I mean, my, my cousin lives down in Kerry and he was like, it's, it's hilarious how the Western world is going about its sort of unfazing the lockdown because they're going, right, now the manufacturers can go back to work and now the, yeah, now the hairdressers can go back to work. And there's this sort of strange kind of economic prism, isn't there, that they're sort of, that they're sort of reactivating society through, which... Yeah, well, economically, we're going to be hit harder and harder and harder the longer that those kind of industries can't start up again so you know we'll hit a harder recession than 2008 and uh, it's going to be a lot of recovery so the, that's the thing there's so many moving parts to this this is it that yeah. it's, it's very and it's so uncertain so to it's i and i get to be fair like from from standing in the middle here you know i think the government ha- actually have a really tough job because they don't know what is going to happen but yet they know the economy has to has to heal so yeah. how do you where's the happy medium here where do you keep the public happy and where do you start to get life getting back to normal for the economy if nothing else I don't it's think very like, very difficult yeah but like in terms of what i was saying like about abolition for instance and in terms of what i was saying about these um about about feminism or um Oh, hello. <laughs> I'll have a little Show us. Next to who's, me. who's there? Who's there? Give us a look. Give us a gander. Who's... <laughs> he might... No, he, he, he ran off. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's shy. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think that... Um, I, I think these, these systems, the way our society is organized, it shouldn't, it shouldn't return to normal. No. We need to be... Well, I mean, not even thinking. I think that the but which which bits are you talking about specifically? Like the when you say normal, you mean I because I, I totally agree. There are things that we've learned from this lockdown that we could certainly massive. change. You know, Ener- what, energy is so a big look, one. energy. It's a massive. Yeah, but like one. I guess like um, you know the 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 kind of um, objective or the rationale or the priority of this of of this government and other. Um, well, let's, let's focus on this government, is completely profit-driven. Before corona started, um, it was apparent that the society we live in is deeply unequal, the most vulnerable in our society, and not even the, the most vulnerable. In fact, everybody beyond like the very rich is actually increasingly, increasingly vulnerable. Yeah. Um, sorry. The, it's fine. It's totally it's fine. Right. Don't, Don't worry about, about it, Emma. It's Don't just hard. It, it's and also, do you know, you know, you have you know to being go Irish, like you kind of apologize. I'm not actually really sorry. I'm more just like saying <laughs> like, like. No, you have to go like, and sort <laughs> out something. Go on. Honestly, one. No, know. he's, he's grand. He's a, he's okay now. Um, We're leaving all this in. It's just, <laughs> it's just distracting you know, when I'm doing this. You know the one thing I saw Tom yesterday on the news, and I don't watch the news very often, but they had the one statistics we were yakking about that. Um, that before this lockdown, 12% of the UK business population worked from home, and during 44% of the 
business population has been able to work from home and remotely. Mm -hmm. I mean, if 44, almost half of the workforce could actually not have a commute, yeah. not waste that time, yeah. not waste those resources, work from yeah. home, run businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, that alone has so many knock on effects to quality of life and a 100%. smaller carbon footprint. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's that, that's, that's really quite radical. And I think um, that's going to be something that is going to be, because people are, if people have seen they can work effectively from home, yeah. they're not going to suddenly be like, okay, yeah, that's cool. I'm going to waste that time. Sorry, I'm just going to deal with the baby. I'll be back in a second. No worries, no worries. <laughs> because you know what, lads, like it'd be interesting on the podcast to kind of explore the wish list, just the wish list of, of, of ways in which we would improve society yeah. uh, post lockdown. And one of the ways yeah. for me would be a massive lurch towards low it carbon, helps. no carbon uh, uh, energy production. Yeah. Because that will, I think, shift the consciousness of... Well, like you say, I mean, more people working from home and less people commuting alone will yeah, but, make a huge difference. But, but also manufacture, you know, manufacture, all that stuff. Like I was, I was watching a video. I, I, again, I'm, I'm always talking from a position of pure ignorance. When <laughs> Guys, by the way, I'm up. back and I just can't see the screen anymore. So I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> you can hear us, but you can't see the screen. I can hear you. Yeah, but I can't. I Your can computer no screen. Oh, I have a similar issue. Our oh, IT back. Is, our IT you got it? Yeah. Go back. You're good. Okay, good. But, um, you know, manufacture all that stuff because I was watching a, a video of the brilliant Chinese electronic music artist, Yeji. Who I oh, I, I love like, Yeji. I was texting, no, the, I I was texting our, our Earth Locker app going, we've got to talk about Yeji as well. She's really cool, right? But there's a video where she's talking to her grandfather and they're reminiscing and they're in a city in China, but the, the, like the mist and the smog and the fog is hanging, you know, where you can't see the tops of buildings. And again, I don't know about, about you know, but I just hear things about the air quality due to the intense levels of manufacture that they yeah. do in China, which leads to these kind of lunchbox cities where yeah, yeah. you can't see you can't, you have no frame of reference. You're not a, yeah. you're not having a full human experience anymore because you can't see the sky. And you think that's only a matter of time happening over here if we don't have a massive shift in how we create the energy to create all the shit we need. It's tricky yeah, because, absolutely. you know, because I, I think as well, because I think like you were saying, Emma, about like people working from home as well. Like the, I think that's, there's so many benefits to that. And then so many things, like you say, Rob, about like alternative energy or more people working from home, so there's less toxins in the air. It's all amazing. And then birds are singing. Yeah, birds are going. The only, the but only also, issue is that there's always a reaction to every action taken, right? So like the the knock on. I mean, I know personally from a lot of friends who are working at home, solely working at home. Their main social interaction is when they go to work. So if they don't go to work. They're not speaking to people face to face. But when they come out of the lockdown, Tom, you know, they'll have ways of socializing that aren't about going into, you know, they'll. they'll oh, yeah, but that's what I'm saying is the only time they did, really. I mean, yeah. they might go out occasionally at the weekend and stuff, but like on a day to day basis, they're really, their interaction with people, if they did change it to that's all it was. Mm. Their interaction with friends and stuff would be massively because their friends are their work colleagues. They could go play squash, couldn't they? <laughs> yeah, and if there was <laughs> universal yeah, basic income, if it was universal basic income, they they could like maybe work less and just hang out with those same friends, like in a in a in yeah. leisure time, or, or actually make connections within their own community and own family. Yeah, yeah and yeah. I, I also up. feel that like that's it's nice for those of us that can work from home, but that's still like. What about all the people that, that like, you know, can't work from home and are Service minimum industry. wage or yeah. London living wage yeah. um, employees, <laughs> which are like just, you know, living actually in, in grinding poverty and are, yeah. are, are not able to like fully enjoy this one beautiful opportunity they have at like being human, yeah. you know? So I just like, 
I just think like in, in terms of like what people are paid for the work they do as well. Um, it's just, it's just criminal. And there's people who are, um, involved in not only non in, in actually like very extractive forces or just, you know, useless work. And they are able to live a very materially privileged life. And then there's people who are doing things that we are all co entirely reliant on as, mm. which has become so, nurses. um, which yeah. has become so, um, obvious during dur during this time and we really need to look at like there being some sort of like redistribution of wealth uh, of the balance yeah it's a savage imbalance right now it is yeah it is it is yeah. i mean you know coming from the right now there's, there's been a savage imbalance like well, for, yeah, for which, me, which this which this government has increasingly um yeah. Yeah. like like worsened and made more and more people yeah. destitute yeah. and now this pandemic has happened so it's just made the reality of that like even starker and then there's all of this um all of this research not even well there's research but also the, the reality of the fact that like at the moment in Britain be a hate saying bane like what the fuck is that but like black asian non-white people are like four times more likely to die of covid than white people and in many ways, this is reflective of the, um, the, 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 the disadvantage that, um, that, that, that exists. Well, it's access to, yeah, the disadvantage and the access to right food, the healthier food options and things like that. And also, I don't want to be a part of yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not being a party pooper. I don't know if it's just time, access to, like, to, like, less access to healthy food, because, um, yeah, I think, I think it's... I think are you talking about in, in the UK or are you talking about worldwide? I'm talking about in the UK. Oh, just specifically the UK? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the there's, UK. There's, there's absolutely that disadvantage in the UK. That is a fact that, that in those areas that where there is a higher percentage of, of ethnic minorities, there is uh, less availability in the, in, uh, for healthier food options. What, in London? In London and all across the UK, unfortunately, really? yeah. Yeah. Same in the US. But, it's, no, it's, no, but you, US, US has like um, the food deserts and mm -hmm. like, yeah, we, yeah. We, it's, it's, no, we don't have food deserts, but the, the access that people are getting in those areas are mainly good. fast food. What, in London? Chicken cottage. Chicken cottage, all those sort of <laughs> things. Yeah, that's the, no, that's black, the people are, black people aren't dying of COVID because of chicken cottage. But there's a diet. A, 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 diabetes problem. We were talking about one a guest who was talking about morbidities, and if there are underlying morbidities that COVID then kind of joins. And one thing is that if there's a life spent eating trans fats and things that are it come from a deep fat fryer, or there's a habit or a regularity in a, mm -hmm. in a community or whatever, that's going to uh, that's going to increase the rate of death from COVID. Yeah, but a lot, like a lot of black people, I'm not vegan, but a lot of people I would know would be, would be vegan. So not only do they not eat chicken cottage, they don't eat meat or animal products at all. But vegan is not necessarily healthy, right? Depending on what choices you're making while being vegan. Because a lot of those people who are vegan eat a high processed food diet. Yeah, so I wasn't necessarily saying that veganism was a, um, was a protection against these things. I was just saying, I don't think it can be I don't think the blame can be located at the foot of chicken shops. No, we're not saying. No, that. we're not saying purely <laughs> chicken. It's, it's like what we're talking about is processed foods, like high, yeah. high trans fats. Okay, 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 okay. So what about this? So also, black women in labour in childbirth are. I actually can't remember. Let me let me just look it up really quickly. So much more likely to die in the UK than um, than white women. Hang on, let me just find this. I mean, what, what, that, are the, what are the causes? What, yeah, what's the factors there, of that? There is an institutional... Structural racism. and institutional racism. Yeah. And my experience is because in against the hospital... Against women of color. And my experiences in the hospital were, like, having, having my children were really... Especially my first experience were really quite frightening. I, at that stage wasn't thinking about it in terms of like a structural issue i was just like wow that was bizarre and surreal and i'm just happy we're both okay what the fuck was that could you tell us what it was well, what was that what happened what happened i'll get to that in a, in a, in a moment okay but then um subsequently to that actually when i was pregnant with my second son all of this research came out um was published about um the experiences that black women have um, in childbirth 
And I was just like, oh, so like now what, what I experienced actually is in this context. It wasn't something that was just like, it wasn't something that was unique to me. And I wasn't able to read the research because I was pregnant with my second son and I was about to be going into hospital again. And I was like really nervous. Um, so I still haven't read the study, but I'm more than happy to, I'm more than happy to share it with you. I think mm -hmm. it's like, um, let me just see exactly what the statistic is, but it's really shocking. Yeah, but but no, tell, tell us about your experience, if you don't mind, Emma, apart from, you know, the statistic grant, whatever, but like, I'd love to hear what, how that manifests. Yeah, I've been treated, yeah. Experience, you know? So there is a, a, a proven um, discrepancy between um, believing like what, what black patients um, say in terms of like medical professionals often you know kind of listening listening to actually what what the patient or what the person is telling them um there's also an idea that black people have like higher pain thresholds so a reluctance to sometimes give so sometimes there's, there's a reluctance sometimes there's a reticence to giving medication and then in other instances there's an over medication um i for instance um this isn't to do with being this isn't to do with um my experiences when i um had my first son i actually you know i hadn't really considered I, I didn't know the conversation was going to go in this direction so i kind of it's a bit intense and i don't necessarily i'm not necessarily going to talk about those experiences okay. but i will talk about another experience where i had to go to the doctor to um i had to go to the doctor basically because i had an issue went to him he was just like yeah whatever like you're grand you're fine get out of my office right. i wasn't grand so i went back to him i brought my at the time um my boyfriend at the time who was like a posh english man he came and sat in the in the um uh thing with me in the doctor surgery with me in the appointment and um listened to me explain to the doctor and the doctor dismissed me again he basically repeated what i had just said and the doctor was just like oh yeah 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 actually so gave me the right prescription and um help that i needed so i basically just needed like a posh white man to interpret my so how is that specific to your skin color then how is it specific to my skin color? Yeah, because you said it because you needed a because it was is that what you're saying? Is it was a, a, a racial experience because you said it's a, you needed a, a, a yeah, white man it, to be able to relate. Yeah, so I'm just so curious he, why he he was as is borne out in multiple studies, which I wasn't privy to at the time. He had a. Um, he just wasn't taking what I was saying at face value. He didn't think that I had the. Um, he just he, he was less inclined to believe what I was saying and he was far he found it far easier to dismiss me but it was when there was somebody more like him relaying the same information it came with more authority you know and he was just like oh right yeah interesting because that, that's a, it's a tricky thing these sort of situations because I've heard this sort of thing before and it's very hard to distinguish of whether his actions there were the way you took them or it could have been like an again like it's it's a sexist act over a racial act right in, in subconsciously his does it does it matter no absolutely no no of course it doesn't matter what, i'm curious what, about whatever, what, whatever his motivation is i'm not getting the help that i yeah i'm entitled to and also i don't think it's racism and sexism can be separated in that way um so it there's i guess that's what like intersectionality is for mm. it's the way that like racism and sexism interplay to particularly um to racism and sexism interplay with each other to give per, a particular experience to black or non-white women which will mm. be different to that of say black men who have different intersections going on yeah Mm -mm. it's interesting yeah wow. it's 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 hard because these experience i hear about these experiences a lot and it's um yeah you're lucky you don't experience them <laughs> well i do well I, in a way i do and my wife does you know my wife had a, a shocking uh, situation it was interesting that's why i wanted to know what happened in your um experience mm -hmm. with having your first with your first son because my wife had a similar thing and i wanted to know if it was if it was comparable with my wife being a white woman and if like if it's just the way the system is if you get the no you should don't get the treatment that you should so yeah so it's definitely an issue i guess there's definitely sexism that um that all women are going to be subject to 
but bear in mind that this 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 ward was full of female midwives and so so, I, so yeah i'm just that, curious but this yeah. is what I, this is going back to what i said earlier um somebody can have internalized racist or patriarchal systems and tr and subject other people to um to the behavior of someone who's internalized those systems and they don't necessarily have they, they can also be victims to those systems like a, so a woman can internalize like patriarchal norms and enact that upon other and enact that upon other women right so it's not it's not just men that behave in this way and that kind of goes back yeah. to what I was saying about body image and stuff and some of the people that can be they can put the most pressure on women are other women have you experienced yeah. it in institutions emma you know, most palpably over the years, has it been in institutional environments or... or Ra racism, sexism, well, all the fun I, things? I, I suppose, you know, the, the, t the way you're saying about your, your boyfriend interpreter being dismissed, feeling like you're invisible to somebody in that way that you described when you went for your doctor's Yeah, opinion. absolutely. So I had really bad experiences in school in Ireland. Um, right. Yeah. Again, I didn't, and I was treated very differently to, there weren't really other black people in my class or my school or even in the country at that time. This is I, Same in, when I grew up, there was like <laughs> one lad, you know, who'd been adopted and he was, he lived around the corner from us. And it was, that that was the sort of environment. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that was me. I was like that. Yeah, I was off like the that bat, you're going to feel segregated, right? Like it's, yeah. as soon as you're in that environment. No, I didn't actually, I didn't feel segregated until like people started like racist towards me. I didn't just like, I, I, I didn't really, I didn't go because I was in the States um, until I was four and then we moved back to Ireland and I was in a very black part of America. Right. So I really wasn't like, I really wasn't thinking about, I just wasn't thinking about race. And yeah, um, yeah. I remember going to Ireland and being called like the N word, like very eeny, meeny, miny, mo. that wow. And I was like, no, but you know, that kind of racism, like people are like, oh, that's so shocking. But I, that kind of racism is, to me, having experienced both, is actually less um, damaging than the implicit stuff, than this institutional stuff yeah. or this medical stuff that actually really like impacts on your life, mm -hmm. on your life opportunities and the, the quality of your life. And it's far easier to name the more obvious stuff and for any normal person to be like oh my god that's so shocking but this other stuff is far more difficult to identify a name and there's always that oh well how do you know it was it, it was this so anyway I, I in this instance it was very explicit and that's what made me feel excluded rather than like a sense of me being like oh i look so different from everybody it was more right. like being told that i was very different to everybody mm. it wasn't something i felt like yeah. um, kind of inherently, but I had really bad experiences in school. Um, I was very like overly punished for like minor, very minor indiscretions and other students, other, I went to all girls schools cause that's what Ireland was like then. I think there's more mixed schools now, but um, I, other girls would be like a lot were a lot more badly behaved than me, but would seemingly like that was fine. But any little thing I did was like very, very, heavy kind of disciplinary action. When I was researching my book, um, I found a report done by the Department of Education, I think in like 1969. So um, 15, I'm in, I was in school, primary school in the early 80s. So I don't know, 15 years before I'm in school. And it talks about um, the, black, the mixed race um, children that were um, seen in industrial schools in Ireland. And um, there's not- for, for, those, for those of, for everyone listening, not in Ireland or in the UK, so an industrial school would have been a, a sort of like a reformatory school. It would have been kind of like school prison for kids. Yeah, prison in is a good were, description of what it is. Yeah, I did, I, yeah, when I was very, very small, I did a film that was set in an old industrial school, like which they were horrible, nightmarish places, horrible, really, traumatic places. Really nightmarish places, Corporal exactly. Corporal punishment, right. sexual abuse went on, you yeah. know, notorious places in the, the abuse was really rampant and yeah. there were very few um i think most of the children that were in ireland at the time were were that were not white were were mixed race there were still very very few um but many of them would end up um in industrial schools because of the stigma of having a um 
like a, a black parent in Ireland at that time than if the parents weren't married. Um, so there's not much documentation of mixed race children in Irish history, but one of the few places, or one of the only places that I saw any was in this report um, for the, that was part of Department of Education um, research. And it said, oh, we found a few of these unfortunate, unfortunate children, how they were described. And it was saying that the boys present less of a problem than the girls, but it was like the girls are a really, really serious problem. It was just like, they're really, they're really hot tempered. They're really like emotionally unstable. Um, they really need to be controlled. And it was like the best thing that we can suggest for them is that as soon as they reach 16 or 18, whatever age it was, that they can leave the industrial schools. This was the suggestion of the report. Um, the best thing we can suggest for them is just that they leave Ireland because there's, there's, there's no place, there's no place for them here. Um, and I was just like, oh, wow, that's what I, as soon as I left school, as soon as I finished school, I left. And I, when I read that report, I was like, oh, this puts a lot of my experiences in school into context. These were the attitudes yeah. that I was encountering. I just, as a child, didn't have access to this research or an understanding of structural or institutional racism. It's interesting how you were experiencing it. You're saying internalizing patriarchal systems and stuff. And you think that that sort of tradition, that layering of that very draconian, very silly, very racist attitude that's sort of institutionalized between church and state, you know, those mm -hmm. schools are run by the church, you know, uh, in Ireland. Um, so you, that, that, that had an echo you know, to up to the point where in the early 80s, you were feeling far more restricted than your classmates because you were essentially maybe seen by your teachers as an outsider or someone. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. And there was still like an attitude very much in Ireland at that time. Like there were, there were no, like, you know what it was like. It was like very homogenous. There were like very, very few black people. And there was a sense of like, like if you were, there was a sense of kind of Africa, you know, just being somewhere that was like entirely reliant on kind of on, on charity and kind of this yeah. like white savior. Trokera. Um, Trokera. I actually did a, a, a campaign for Trokera and I was yeah. a Trokera model. There you go. Nice. Um, <laughs> the hell was Trokera? Trokera. <laughs> well, that dieting certainly paid off. <laughs> <laughs> this was before the dieting. I don't think they wanted... Um, I don't think they necessarily wanted me to be like attracted. Right. But it's Troker is an Irish charity. Troker is an Irish word. I don't know what it means. Does I think it, it might just mean charity. Charity. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it was for, uh, it was for African charities. It was for the, th the third world. And so, the you third know, as, world, as, yeah. as an Irish child growing up, you're absolutely right. My kind of exposure to... Africa would have been through charity ads on the telly. You yeah, know, maybe uh, featuring me. <laughs> five pounds a month. There's Emma looking. <laughs> there she is. No, I, I'd forgotten. It was. A, I think it was a collaboration between Troker and like Supermax. Do you remember that? What on earth is Supermax? <laughs> How? Where's the Venn diagram cross section? Yeah, I don't know. I'd actually for, I'd forgotten about it. But anyway, um, yeah. So there was an attitude was that like, like wimpy. It was like the Irish wimpy. Yeah. Oh yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's so like kind of burgers, like and kebabs and pizzas. Like it just <laughs> oh, was brilliant. That's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, there was an attitude that like, if you were like, that I should kind of, you know, be grateful for being there. Cause I've probably been saved from like the Ethiopian famine yeah, yeah. Um, or something yeah, yeah. like that. And I was actually quite like a spirited, um, little person. And I don't think I was like meek enough, you know? So that was yeah. very angering seemingly to yeah. a lot of my teachers. And I remember collecting money for the black babies, collecting pennies for the black babies. And I had just come back, this was the phrase that was used. And I had just come back from Nigeria. My Nigerian grandparents are like extremely wealthy. And I was just like, I don't, I was nine or so. I was like, I, do, I don't think like they need your pennies. Like my grandparents have like the chauffeur and like, da -da -da. <laughs> And uh, I got like, I got pulled out of my classroom and just told to stop lying. That I needed to get over the chip on my shoulder. Wow. It was just it was very confusing. You lying. Know? <laughs> stop lying. Yeah. 
Imagine that. Stop lying about your grandparents' <laughs> chauffeur. From a he country doesn't, that they've never stepped foot on. He doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> so mental. It's That's so crazy. mental. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it is, it is, it's, it's extraordinary the kind of, um, you know, the institutional racism the bubbling, thing, I'm, I'm kind of bringing me back, Tom, what you were talking about and Emma, you're talking about, well, Tom, you talked about not, people not having friends except in their office place. The fact that people need to get out of this institutionalized bubble, you know, mm, like cops do totally. it, law enforcement, regardless of your race, you toe the line, the blue line, and you do all the institutional racist, homophobic, you know, it's us against them because it's institutionalizing you and it supersedes your racial cultural identity. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and same thing with the nurses in the hospitals who do regular health care, who haven't really been awakened to other ways of looking. Mm -hmm. You know, we thought, need to break down these institutions. These institutions are yeah, designed yeah, yeah, yeah. to just like Pink Floyd's The Wall, just grind us yeah. to think. Yeah, that's part of the problem. Yeah. Us. We are here. They to force us to, be, to, to toe the line. You, you know, see, that movie all has to completely stop. more Straight disobedience. Of, yeah, <laughs> I liked that. There was a great scene in that movie, Straight Out of Compton, which I thought they dealt with that issue very, very interestingly because they're they're hanging out outside their new record label, and you know it's their first taste of success and NWA, and then the cops come around and they start treating them like trash and bullying them and stuff, and it takes the Paul Giamatti figure to come out and be like, "How dare you!" and sort of show his authority as a yeah the same experience citizen. she had in the doctor's office yeah yeah exactly you know? yeah exactly exactly it is yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, it happens with historic um regularity yeah, yeah. Thing. it's not just a coincidence there is something deeper at play here people yeah. are actually brainwashed to behave certain ways well byron yeah, as a non-white sure. man how do you feel in uh, having been in london now for shy on 15 years do, have you ever felt that kind of uh divisiveness that kind of separation interestingly because me and my partner have this argument all the time because your partner is amanda and she's amanda, she's, yeah. she's she's black she, she's yeah of african descent african so. descent zulu um cool. she loves to tease me and call me white and i like to point out to her that i'm not white <laughs> <laughs> um because of i don't know why i laugh so much at that <laughs> people love that we just a never this is a never ending jive because <laughs> when i was a kid growing up in l.a you know, I couldn't walk down the street for a block and a half and not get pulled over by a sheriff. Mm -hmm. Asked me what I was doing in that neighborhood, checking my pockets, frisking me down. Because they like, thought you were Latina? Yeah, they thought I was a Mexican. Yeah. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't look white. Mm -hmm. So you were carrying a machine gun at I the was, time. No, I was just, I was, you know, it, it was just amazing. And they didn't believe me, like my little Bible study I was in when I was 12, 13 years old. Oh, like, oh. Stay, stay a block behind me and see what happens when I walk ahead. And sure enough, the sheriffs come by and stop me. So... Well, yes, I assimilate very, very well because I taught myself and I educated and I had really great friends around me in community. So I know how to behave properly in an Anglo affluent setting. But even that language, I don't actually like, feel at my core that I ever am that way because I, I know what it feels like to be brought out and to be discriminated against. You know, and it really yeah. bothered me at my core. It's a, yeah, and, and, and the way, even the sort of the semantics around how you described it, so I know how to behave properly to, for an Anglo, you know, it's like you, that there's this line that you've to, to feel. Yeah, I'm to almost that institutionalized mindset myself. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah like I, I will even like walk into like shops um, in certain areas. And, you know, if I'm wearing, say, sportswear and my hair is in a particular way, the way I'm treated in those shops until I, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll talk and then I'll hear my accent. And then like, I'm, it's like, you have to do something to like perform that you're not the set of assumptions right. they have put on you. I had an instance with my brother um, where, so my brother is, yeah, well, mi mixed race as well. My, our mum is white. Um, we were going, my mom was having, this was in London, my mom was going to have a massage and me and my brother were just dropping her off at the place. My brother is like super, like, like he rose. I don't know if you can get like posher than that. Um, he's just like very, yeah, anyway. Um, he, we were walking into the massage place and he lives in Ireland as well. So he's not like kind of au fait with all the, the way things play out here. I walked in, I was fine. My mom walked in, that was grand. My brother is coming behind us. He's very tall, he's like six foot six. Um, wow. He had his hood up 
um, the woman in the reception like ju like jumped out of her chair, ran to the door and started pushing it and was just like, no, no. <laughs> <I was> just, <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> what? And then she was like, is he with you? Is he with you? I'm like, yeah, that's my, that's my brother. And she was just like, oh, okay, it's fine. So we, we've had, um, we've had some, some problems with the boys in the estate. Da, da, da. I was just like, this is wild. So that's even a level like I don't experience, you know? Um, but then again, that was more explicit. So more, e so easier to, to kind of contest in a way. Mm. Yeah, it's real. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's you crazy. know, we like to think in this, neoliberalism the age and everything's there are no problems what are you talking about mm. you it's know it's all, all it's all just grand it's all aspirational yeah actually that's a good question because we were talking about neoliberalism neoliberalism neo come on byron you're supposed to be a podcast host you can't even say words out your mouth it. good bad what the hell is it neoliberalism is awful yeah <laughs> <laughs> and what is it but, okay yeah. how do you define it Ah, you know what? In in um my in don't touch my hair, I actually give like a definition of it because there's like um, I guess confusion about what it is. I I would actually quite like yeah. to just read the definition. <laughs> One second, give me a moment. Do. Yeah, it'd be good for the uh, listeners to hear this. Yeah, because I uh, yeah yeah. yeah no. There's a lot of people that will have never heard of neoliberalism, so this is a good one. It's an economic model. It's an economic model that governments facilitate. Yeah, but it's like highly like extractive and yeah. okay. So no, now I'm just getting deep into like sorry, like socialist like papers. <laughs> I think you're reading spiders, or you're watching. You're playing Spider Solitaire, aren't you? <laughs> you're there playing Candy Crush. Just you know what? This is really interesting. When you just Google it, it, which is what I'm doing now, rather than reading the um, the definition of my book, because I don't have no. You know what? I can just get the PDF of my book up because this is interesting. When when I when I just Googled it, there, it's all actually very neoliberal definitions of it so yeah. they're actually quite generous towards they're like oh it's just free market relations excert 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 so it's not it's not just that it's like a deeply like evil and extract let me get it up hang on my my desktop is a mess wow give us a this is great we're getting a book reading from mm. don't touch my hair <laughs> by its author if she okay. ever bloody finds the thing. Oh my God, no pressure. <laughs> on the de How messy is your desktop? Is it like, are there That's files on mess. files? Is it like one of them multi multiverses? It's just, <laughs> it's just a disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here it is. Oh yeah, okay. Damn it. <laughs> okay and, uh, so i have a few different definitions oh my god this is so stressful okay 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 um so what i write is like the fact that most most forms of inequality in today's world find their origins in the neoliberal logic underpinning the industries and institutions, you know, that, that ground our society. So it's just, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's free market, free market, free market capitalism that kind of tries to put a monetary value on every single aspect governing like nature and human relations, which is like deeply psychotic. Yes, it and, is. And mm -hmm. just seeks to um, you know, bring everything under the auspices of the market, including like the environment, which is leading to the entire complete destruction of the environment mm. and including all aspects of human, of human emotion. So yeah, it's just like a, a deeply like ex ex extractive and destructive force. I guess it's like in, in many ways, like the opposite of, of, of socialism. And it's about like the private accumulation of wealth at the explicit, based on the exploitation of the world's resources and the resources of and the exploitation of most of the people in the world to yeah. create like a small kind of elite who hoards wow. vast yeah. sums of money. 
that I seemed just good. That rather than looking for all that stuff that I couldn't. But find. it was nice though. It was pretty good. It's it essentially sums up where we are as a society. Yeah, yeah. We have a kind of a one percent. And one of the reasons why we started the Earth Locker, I think. Yeah, that, exactly. You know, like it's, it's taken it's away our like choice. Down, it's like going hang on. systems. Yeah, why should we just succumb to the things that you say we should do? Because mm-hmm. marketing and the yeah. hierarchies of the government say yeah. do this. And you're right. It's it's all about this this free market, which I think changes people's relationships to themselves. Really, when there's this, as you said, there's this internalization that the you must commodify any aspects that the world finds commodifiable. You know, you mm. and it, it, it like you you meet people sometimes, unfortunately, who are doing it unaware, you know, oh, like yeah, I'm, I'm on the telly and I, sometimes you meet people and they're talking to you like you're a fucking, like you're, you're a giant dollar sign that they, they, they just need to massage or in the right angle to commodify somehow. You go, wow. Oh, but you can, you know, people are like, and that's the, it seems to be the kind of, uh, yeah. you know the thing that affects people but it, it makes perfect sense I've felt that in a personal way with people yeah yeah ab- absolutely I think that's really powerful as well when you you kind of can think about how these things are felt um, on a personal level and how it's kind of internalized by individual people as well and mm-hmm. I mean the beginning of neoliberalism is kind of dated like in 1979 and it, it's really advanced by Reagan by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher so if you think about the politics and the objectives of those two individuals, mm. um, it's quite like revealing about the, 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 the nature of, um, of neoliberalism. Was it there true no that society. under the Reagan government, they massively flood black, flooded black and Latino areas with uh, recently uh, created crack cocaine, which was highly, highly addictive, essentially in order to uh, make the drug illegal so that they could arrest anyone with the drug. Although it was a, it was actually funding funding the covert wars that Reagan and Bush were doing. Yeah, the CIA <laughs> so, in South America yeah, wasn't yeah, it in Central and South America? Amazing. They were Ollie North in those trials. That's what, that's when I was a young man watching that live on TV. Wow, yeah, how ridiculous that was! Yeah, I mean, it it almost like a government kind of like flooding COVID into kind of. Yeah. marginalized areas yeah. and proper, upper, and populations or, today. Yeah, or HIV, you know, so like it, it really is comparable. And as you said, uh, neoliberalism are, were, is the objectives and aims of the same type person who was, a, was over and above uh, a decision to do that, you know. That's a genocidal move. It's, Absolutely. I don't think that language is, is, um, is, is excessive. I think that is what it yeah. is. Yeah. Guys, um, we're going to kind of getting a little, kind of wrapping it up here. Also, I'll be honest, Emmett, this room has turned into a fucking sweatshop. No, oh, it, it looks hot. It I, does look hot. Uh, I'm roasting as I well. I just need I'm to. comfortable. <laughs> Whatever hydration I haven't sweated out has gone into my bladder. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> you know, I mean, for me, guys, this topic, and Emma, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, you've yeah. always had... Uh, you and I've had the most amazing conversations over the years, and you're somebody who I respect immensely, immensely, immensely. Thank you, Byron. So having you as a guest on the show has been great. Yeah. And you know, while it might not seem like this is prevalent to what the Earth Locker is about, it really is. It is. You yeah. know, we all have to think outside the box. Mm-hmm. We can't. We have to fix what's broken yeah. in this system. And that goes to the politics, and that has to go to institutional racism and, it was and a, neoliberalism. There was a lovely message in. Uh, I was idly boasting about this film I did a few years back with Ben Elton and it was it was it was all set in a one campground in Australia and it was set in this folk music festival that happens over three summers consecutively and it's sort of Australia in a tent that's how Ben Elton described it wow and at the end there's a character who's kind of racist and he's sort of he, he was played by the wonderful Michael Caton this beautiful Australian older actor and um at the end he goes we have to start learning each other's stories, you know, the, the, like the stories, the histories, the cultures of people who are stood right next to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're all occupying the same space. We're all using the same institutions. We're all kind of, you know, and that's, I think it's a good place for equality to start is to actually, you know, start hearing about other people's experiences in parallel universes, you know, 
Yeah, and, uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of like systems, ways of organizing society that are at their core egalitarian. And if we actually listened to some of the voices or some of some of the cultures who have been um, intentionally and systematically silenced for centuries, we might like kind of discover some kind of innovative ways of, of reorganizing society in a way that it functions for all of us. Yeah. Wow. Can we do a part two, Emma? Can we do an egalitarian Earth Locker episode part two? Because I'm up for it. when you when you wandered off there mid podcast, <laughs> which I'm Johnny messing with. No, I did, I did. You, <laughs> I did. Just you want me. We were like post lockdown wish list. You know, <laughs> we should start kind of generating yeah, well, that and thinking about let's regroup after all Wait. this is done. We yeah. have a little history under our belts to critique. Yeah. Yeah. And, and ways of redesigning, you know, ways that we can yeah. spread that, spread good ideas. To I actually, of- I go into a lot of that in, in Don't Touch My Hair because I really cover a lot more ground than hair. I use it as kind of a jumping off point mm. to look at like a lot of um, indigenous African kind of ethics and philosophy. So a lot of, a lot of that stuff is in there. I'd be happy to share it with you. And we, right. never, we never even got around to Afrofuturism. Ah. Which- is that, it, that sounds like a topic. It's an itself. episode yeah. all in itself, at the very least. Emma, where can yeah. uh, where can people find your book and yeah. your everything, and how they can get and reach out to you and support you? Yeah, so social media, just my name, Emma Dabbery. Um, the book is called Don't Touch My Hair in the UK and Ireland. You can just get I mean, it at any regular book place. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> the um, in America is called Twisted. It'll be out on the 23rd of June. Sweet! And disobedientbodies.com. Oh, yeah, disobedientbodies.com. The website is up now. It's an Instagram account. There's a, it's a virtual book club. So two days ago, we had a conversation with Kylie Reed, who wrote um, Such a Fun Age, New York Times bestseller, really incredible book about um, black nannies in the States um and kind of like feminists um online influencers and lot, yeah it's a really amazing book so that was the oh, that was our inaugural awesome. session and yeah well oh, yeah cool. get, get involved but if you have a disobedient body go and check out <laughs> the website <laughs> absolutely even if you just <laughs> like to have a more disobedient body yes. if you aspire yeah. to a disobedient body yeah Indeed. Great, nice guys. Thank you, so much. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Ciao. Uh, Have a good weekend. You too. Corona. Oh, my God. Listen, Earthlings. So much good stuff happens in these podcasts, and they're so much fun to make. And we try to put it out there to give you a little bit of value. If you enjoyed listening to us interview and talk to each other, then please take a moment like subscribe tell a friend leave a review give us five stars if you think we deserve five stars and leave us some comments we are new and we definitely read all of your comments thanks again for listening to the earth locker. the earth locker is produced by byron knight edited by luna wolf of disturbiafilms.com director of photography christopher assock technical assistance by the multi-talented storm stewart with big thanks for technical support from Cheat London, Coloring and Finishing Post Production, Cheatit.co, and The Flow State Productions. Listen, lads, the Earth Locker podcast is opinions of the hosts and of the guests, and it's not Bible, it's not fact, it's just a platform for sharing ideas, right? And all the content of this podcast is solely owned by us. That's right. And copyrights reserved by the Earth Locker. The content here should not be taken as medical or financial or psychological or spiritual or bestial advice. The whole point of this podcast was to bring people who've been who spent their lives studying something on to kind of to share with us what they know. You know, and and then essentially improve planet Earth. So, uh, so the show the show's for informational purposes. It's for sharing ideas, having a laugh, and because each person is so unique and so saucy, you gotta consult your own doctor for any medical questions. You gotta talk to your financial advisor if you're a big shot on Wall Street, 
And if you wish to invest in this podcast, we will take any size investment. <laughs> Down to 20 pence, anything you have, any spare change. And so here, speak with your elders about personal and spiritual matters. They know shit. They've lived it. You know, all of us slightly younger crowd. We're just riffing. We're just pretending we know. The content of this podcast might have settled during transport and batteries are not included. <laughs> God, let's hope that doesn't make it into the jingle. <laughs>